A reading from Matthew. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, the person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bear fruit, and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The garden I planted back in April hasn't produced much of a harvest. Not one of the six tomato plants has yielded a single tomato. The row of desiccated corn stalks looks like something out of an apocalyptic film. Even the hot pepper plants, intended to be the pride and joy of my garden, have given up the ghost. If the farmers back in Batesburg, Leesville knew how badly my gardening skills have deteriorated since returning to the suburbs, they would probably pull me aside for some sort of agricultural intervention. It's that bad. That said, I have high hopes for a particular squash plant. She's a beauty and massive covering five or six square feet on this Sunday morning. By my count, the hardy specimen has 18 flowers to date, each with the potential of producing a large yellow straight neck squash. With luck, the success of Bertha. Yeah, I've named this plant. Bertha will inspire her little sisters to get to work. Only time will tell. If you planted a garden before, if you've sowed some seeds, you know the math is not good. Consider your vegetable plants. Generally, three of every four seeds you sow will never produce a thing. By my math, that's a 75% fail rate. Of those three, two of the fails will germinate and sprout up and seem to grow successfully for a while, only to go the route of my corn, that is, wither and die. The third of the failed seeds will wash away, dry up, or be devoured by some sort of winged creature before the seed has the time to really plant that first root into the ground. But then there's that rare Bertha birthing seed. Maybe a squash, maybe a tomato, maybe a Carolina reaper pepper. Despite the bad math, there's always that particular seed destined to grow sturdy roots. Despite the heat, the storms, the predators, it's this seed that will spread its branches far and wide when it grows flowering. Despite our disappointment in the rest of our efforts in the garden, 
there's always the one seed that will produce far beyond expectation. 18, 60, 90, even a hundredfold. And it's that one seed that makes all the effort worth it. Listen, Jesus says, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came up and ate them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. And we do listen, don't we? And as we listen to what Jesus has to say this morning, I suspect most of us remember just how much we love this particular parable. It's one of the best. Variations on this gardening vignette are found in three of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And like the other parables, this one has Jesus using the power of storytelling to say something profound about the movement of grace in the world. Jesus is tapping into those things that are familiar and common and organic to help us understand a little more about the intersection of God's story and our own. A sower went out to sow, Jesus tells us. We all know the story well enough to paraphrase it. And inevitably, when we hear the parable again, like this morning, we tend to focus on the growing conditions, the soil, the us part. I know I do. Am I like the pathway, resistant to the good work of the sower, the good news rolling off into the gutter or into the beaks of the birds? Am I the rocky ground, the root depth of my faith shallow, unprepared for hardships and setbacks, hail and heat? Or am I sown among thorns? surrounded by distractions and distortions that choke my discipleship and diminish my ability to produce a harvest? Let's be honest with ourselves. This is our de facto interpretation of the parable. More often than not, we hear Jesus' story as a word of judgment leveled against us about whether we're good enough or strong enough or faithful enough to be in the garden in the first place. Well, let's dial that back this morning and consider this instead. The parable of the sower is about, well, the sower, not us. God is the subject here. Notice how Jesus begins the story. He says, a sower went out to sow. It's all about God. And notice how this sower goes about the work. There's a disregard for the dismal math of planting seeds, the one in four. If the sower knows that only one in four seeds is going to yield a straight neck squash, then the sower ought to be selective about where the planting takes place in the first place. How many seeds are positioned in the ground at a given time or when and if the planting should be suspended until the conditions are just right. But no, a handful is tossed here and there and way back on the corner 40 of the lot. There's another handful and yet another and another. Really? Who would do this sort of thing? Even I know that this is a terrible way to garden. The sower is indiscriminate in the seed sowing, careless, maybe even wasteful 
by our standards. Or could it be generosity instead? Boundless love. Grace. You see, the sower knows that it only takes one seed to yield an unimaginable harvest. 18, 30, 60, 90, even 100 fold. And so the sower keeps tossing the seed. Here's what I know about us, all of us. Our soil conditions are constantly changing. I'd like to think I'm loamy soil more often than not, good soil for God's word and work. But I know myself. I know I can be hard of heart some days, shallow and prickly, especially prickly. But you're the same way, aren't you? And just think about our collective pH in these months since March, how acidic we've become. Let's be honest about it. For reasons largely beyond our control, we are a parched, cracked, bitter bunch these days. But here's the good news. God's never going to run out of seed or walk away from the garden. We are covered in extravagant grace. Even in the harshest conditions, the sower knows that some seeds will take root, flower, and produce the sort of harvest this world needs right now. And so I ask you, where is God's love taking root in your life at this very moment? As you consider my question, be sure to grab your own handful of seeds and start tossing them in all directions. Sow your love in this hurting world. And trust the sower, God to nourish what you planted. Amen.